no, not a big surprise. It tends to all track. It's the same people that are doing the crime, whether it's a prolific offender or whether it's somebody in a vulnerable community, that whether it's addictions or mental health. So we tend to see the very same types of outcomes. So if we look at Karameas, where the theft from vehicle is very low for 2017, that, that's quite common in a smaller community, whereas in some of the bigger communities such as Summerland or South Okanagan, that's Oliver and the Soyuz combined, then we tend to see that there's a, a bit of a, um, a bump in those types of thefts, those lower end thefts from auto, crimes of opportunity. So where somebody is walking by, sees a loony in your cup holder, breaks the window and steals a loony. And it really does happen. So that is entirely preventable and that's what we want to get to. Violent crime. Again, from a police officer's perspective, that's our bread and butter. We want to keep violent crime down. And I, I use some downtown Penticton stats here. When we hear people talk, I read sometimes the letter, well, often, the, the letters to the editor where people say, I don't feel safe going downtown. We want to change that. Whether it's Summerland or Penticton or Soyuz or Princeton, come downtown. Come on downtown and have fun. Take control of our own communities. We can do that. We can absolutely do that. It doesn't take a police officer to be walking downtown. It takes all of us going out for dinner and going out to the movies and going to all of the events. This is an awesome place to live. Regardless of which community you're from, it's outstanding. We moved here for a reason. If you weren't born here, you moved here for a reason. It's outstanding. So why do we have this perception that there's some kind of danger when the facts of the matter say that it's almost non-existent when we look at that from a, a violent crime perspective? From a social perspective and from a social order perspective, yes, we have some issues that we need to re resolve. And a lot of those issues revolve around a very small core of people who I would consider vulnerable as opposed to criminals. Collisions is the last one of our big charts here that we're going to talk about. The other question that we get um, is what are we doing about traffic? And why are we doing things like giving tickets to people for their cell phones, distracted driving? That's the reason. 12 people died last year from between Summerland and Princeton. Six of them in Penticton detachments area, which includes Naramata to Okanagan Falls. Six people in this community died, and a good percentage of them are associated to distracted driving. Nobody died in this community from a phone being stolen from a passenger seat. Many people died from a phone being used in the driver's seat. So that's why we are going after people that are doing those things, distracted driving, whether we're sitting on a bus in partnership with our South Okanagan Traffic Services, or whether we see you, at, and if you can believe it, in a marked police car rolling up to a stop sign or to a, an intersection and someone's texting away and don't even see the marked police car. Talk about distract driving. <laughs> I mean, it, that, that pretty much, and they're leaving that intersection still typing away. And we wonder why we have these kind of statistics. The good news, 2018, quarter one, so that's January to March, not a single fatality. The bad news, we've had 34 or 35 fairly senior, serious collisions already. But if we can keep those numbers down, we're in good shape. So vulnerability versus criminality, this is always the big question. So are all those people that you see, the guy that's drinking a beer on the square, is that legal? No. Do we have a responsibility as police to deal with that? Yes, and we will. And you'll see some of the things that we're going to be doing in terms of patrols and getting people out there to deal with that. But is that person a criminal? Is there a reason or is there a story behind how that person happened to be there? These are some of the things that we tend to see. Um, addictions, homelessness, social chronics. So somebody, that guy that's just always out there, he may be, he's not really committing crime, but he's just out there causing a little bit of a, an issue for our community and mental health. And we look at that, and a lot of people from a perception see crime. It must be crime that's happening with those people. Quite frankly, I don't lose a lot of sleep over the people that we're talking about on this slide in terms of committing crime. I lose sleep over people that are not homeless, that are prolific offenders, that are career offenders and career criminals, that are not stealing change out of the cup holder of an unlocked car but are stealing a forty or fifty thousand dollar tractor from a winery. 
Those are the people that I lose sleep about. Those are the people that, as your police chief, I need to target and that we need to put our resources to to make sure. It's not to say that we're going to turn a blind eye on the, the other folks around this continuum, but that's how we're going to do it. Multi-agency response. We're going to bring a whole bunch of people together to look at resolving that. And all of our partners, some of whom are going to be here on the panel, are going to be involved in that. And that brings us to the community active support table. So we've, you've heard me say it before, over 60% of the calls for service from the RCMP the regional detachment are not criminal. They are not chargeable for that matter. It means that 60% of the police work were not out getting bad guys and putting them in jail. And what we are dealing with is poverty and mental health addictions and homelessness. And that last comment, to maintain a safe community, we need more than great policing. And am I biased? Do we have great policing? Can we do better? If we can, I want to hear from you. But when we tar start talking about numbers of 18% drop in violent crime, and year to date for 2018, a 14% drop in property crime, which is the only community in the Okanagan that's experienced that, I think the police and you and all of our partners working together are starting to do a good job. And that's what we have to start continue to focus on. Reduction in social disorder, crime victimization, and partner agency pressures, that's the goal of the community active support team. So in terms of social disorder, those people that are on the street that are in downtown Penticton or in downtown Osoyoos that are causing issues and give us a perception that this is not a safe place to be, we want to get them out of that condition and get them the help they need. Help they need. If it's addictions, then we need to get them out of that lifestyle and into treatment. If it's mental health, same thing. If it's dual diagnoses, that's the same person that, with multiple conditions, then we need to get them the help that they need. And that, in turn, reduces victimization and our partner agency pressures. If we apprehend someone under Mental Health Act, that's a police officer that's transporting him to the hospital, that's a nurse and a doctor and security and in the emergency room that are being used for sometimes hours in terms of the treatment that, that they have to offer, incredibly expensive and incredibly resource intensive. And if we can get that person to help, if addictions is the reason they're stealing things out of your cup holder, then it's going to solve some of our crime issues. So how it works, it's not a policing model, but a community safety model. We all in it together. That's what we're, we're looking for, and it's very partner agency um, intensive, very structured conversations with senior leaders. So the people that are sitting at the table are people like me, are people like Kevin Fraser, the director of mental health in, for interior health, and people that can make decisions and allocate resources and finances to make sure that these things are going to get done. And that the, this 24 to 48 hour intervention that we're talking about is that person that's causing issues on a downtown corner, within 24 to 48 hours, we're going to move them and get them going to where they need to be. If it doesn't work and they come back, then we'll do it again until we can get to the point where we start to reduce some of that social disorder. Collaboration of applicable service providers with one lead agency. If the person's criminality means that he has 10 warrants for his arrest, but really that's driven by mental health or addictions, the police will probably take the lead and we'll go and arrest them and find them and arrest that person. But then we work with our partners to treat that person and get them the help that they need so that they're not back into the warrant. So moving forward, and we're almost done. We're getting to the panel. I went a little bit over time here. Some of the things that we're doing um, moving forward, CAST, we've talked about that, the Community Active Support Table. CSET, you're going to see a lot more enhanced patrols in all of the communities of the regional detachment. Some of that is going to be done by overtime, some of that's going to be done by scheduling. We're going to be out on bikes, we're going to be out on ATVs, on our UTV, you'll see us on the boat out there. Footbeat, bike patrols in the downtown core, that's all happening starting in May are May 1st, and in Penticton, for instance, the first time that the market starts is when you're going to see some of the, the teams rolling, and certainly we're going to be rolling that out through our seasonal policing program. Fugitive return program, I think some of you may have seen that in the media today. So someone with 24 warrants that moved to our community to get away from those warrants from another province, back you go, you're going back. And that's a program that's offered by a provincial police service, which is the E Division um, of the RCMP and moving back and so we're going to start doing that. We're going to make a big use out of that program 
and return, move to treatment. Three, I believe, three or four people in the last month or month and a half have been moved into either treatment or into familial care. So they're off the street. So those are some of the more prolific people that we've seen out on the streets, certainly in Penticton. And they're getting the help, or at least they're off the street, and we can maybe move them into a treatment. And working with bylaws, security, and CSET, so those joint patrols, is something that we'll be rolling out as well. Quarterly reporting, again, it's about holding us accountable. So the quarterly report, so we have the annual performance plan, but we also have the quarterly report that's going to be released to the media. It is already available. It's prepared for mayor and council of all of our communities and the regional district. So it's available, and the next one will be coming out at the end of this month into early May, so that you can see some of the things that we're doing and some of the challenges that we are trying to address. Coffee with a cop, I talked about that already. Getting together, we're going to have an open house this summer, probably towards the end of the summer. So it's your police station, we're your police service, we should invite you into our building, but not in the back of a police car. So you're gonna come in through the front door and see how the, what the operations are. And when you hear things about carbines, those are expensive pieces of equipment. What is it? Why do we have it? What's the need for it? And ATVs and all the different things, the dual tools that we have to support this community, we want you to come in and have a look and see how that works. And finally, the, uh, really what I want to focus on that is the, the question at the bottom. Do we have a policing problem? Or do we have a crime problem? Or do we have a marginalized people problem? Those are the questions that I'm struggling with and looking for answers for. Do we have a policing problem? I, I think if we have mistakes that our police force makes, then we need to hear about them and we need to resolve those. Do we have a crime problem? It's crime, absolutely. I would say that we have more have a marginalized people problem. The people that are causing the majority of the things that cause us to think that this is, our community is unsafe, which it is not unsafe, those are the people that we need to focus our efforts on collectively. So finally, what about you? These are some of the things that we're looking for. And I mentioned that last, and that final one, or at the last forum, Report, report, report. If you see something, say something. We stole that from Homeland Security, south of the border. So it is something that we, we absolutely need your help with. As the mayor said earlier, the fire chief isn't rolling around looking for fires. He cannot do that. He relies on you to call him and alarm systems. We simply do not have enough police officer to be on every street corner. That's not realistic. And if we could do that, then the people that are causing some of the issues would find a different street corner to do it. We need you to call us, and that drives our statistics. We may not always come. Sometimes the, the things that are out there, uh, the, the concerns a suspicious person would be gone by the time we got there, but it allows us to track and determine exactly where the things are happening in our community. And finally, if that's something that you're interested in, if you really want to be a, a part of policing, we're hiring. The gates are wide open at depot. And there's an information session Wednesday, April 18 in Kelowna. And if you have um, family members, friends, anybody that's interested, that's my pitch. Come on, and we'll make sure that you come back to Penticton or to the South Okanagan. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn this over to the panel. So Dave Hansen is our moderator today. Dave has, what, 29 years of policing experience, about 21 in the RCMP, spent a lot of time as a dog handler, and then with the, as an inspector in the transit police, so he's no stranger to some of these issues. Um, I'll let him introduce our panel. I'll sit down here and turn over the lapel mic to him. I'll introduce our panel. Uh, as I know them, let me see as we go across here, so I'll get everybody's, because we weren't sure where everybody was going to be sitting, so oh, I've got Debbie first. Wendy Fackham, Daryl, we've got Manfred, and Kevin. So, uh, Superintendent Jagger, you've already met. If I can uh, make my way from uh, left, my, my left to the right, I'll introduce uh, Debbie Scarborough. Debbie's the Executive Director for SOWINS, the South Okanagan Women in Need Society, and also she's representing, and she's also with the Coroner's Office here within the province. Um, Next to Debbie, we have uh, Wendy Heyer, who's the superintendent of schools, so welcome to both of you. And on her right, we have Daryl Myers, who's the executive director with Pathways Addiction Resource Center. And to her right, we have Manfred Bauer. So Manfred 
is the mayor in Karameas, but tonight he's here as the uh, vice chair of RDOS, so that's who he's representing tonight. And finally, last but not least, on his right is Kevin Fraser, and Kevin is with Interior Health, and he's the manager of mental health and substance use in the South Okanagan. So I apologize, I've got the glasses up. We kind of, I'm at that tender age where we go glasses up, glasses down, depending where we're reading and what crowd we're looking at here. So uh, this format's very simple if I give it two seconds. So these questions, uh, there's about 30 basic questions, but there's some sub questions. These were all generated by the questions that were sent into the proxy. And I think sort of this was a very, very good idea to get these in, to get some of those questions in advance. So what I'll do is I'll formulate, some of them are long, so I've paraphrased some of the questions, and then I'll turn them over to the respective members of the panel who might be best uh, prepared to answer the questions. So I'll show them to you one at a time. You'll see as we go along, some of them are longer. Bear with me. Hopefully I'm not talking too quickly and people will be able to follow along. But so for question number one, uh, wondering why the police haven't used bait cars in Penticton to try and catch and deter thieves from breaking into vehicles. So that one we'll turn over to Superintendent DeJager. We do use bait cars and that's hopefully the whole point is that you don't see them and that you don't know that they're bait cars. Um, we have used them effectively. We haven't deployed them um, in recent months since our target enforcement unit has been very successful in some of our more, shall we say, prolific auto thieves. So you'll see from our stats that auto theft has gone down, but the bait car program you may have seen in the media is alive and well. Um, right now they're being used in Kelowna and we'll certainly use that as I'm looking back at my TEU members, see if they're going to be nodding their heads, but they don't want to give away the, the story. But they are out there and thieves beware. And I don't think there's anybody else on that. What, I, what I'll do is I'll give you guys an opportunity, I'll give you a quick look. If there's something you want to add, let me know. But for some of them that are straight up crime, we'll just leave them to the superintendent. How's that? So question two is a multi-part question. And basically it was sent in sort of asking, um, uh, talking about the RCMP and asking a number of points. So there are three sub points and basically 2.1, and I'm not sure if you'll be able to see it uh, on the screen. Uh, if you can, would the use of police bike patrols in the downtown area have a positive impact on crime? Superintendent. Yes. 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 It would, and that is one of our plans. But we're not just going to use bike, plant, bike patrols. So as I mentioned, our overtime and our Enhanced patrols are going to be starting up in May throughout the South Okanagan, not just in Penticton, and our seasonal policing and bikes are a big part of that. One of the challenges with bikes is the training that we have. So we also have all-terrain vehicles that we'll be using. We are getting a um, utility terrain vehicle um, that can move around and move through the parks and up the KVR and through all of our pathways and across the beaches. And you'll see Footbeat as well. So those different things, not to mention members in Red Surge, particularly for some of our bigger events, um, some of the community events like Canada Day, Peach Fest here in Penticton, Cherry Festival in Soyuz, um, the market, will have members in Red Surge, so there's going to be much more of that happening. Great, thank you. 2.2 uh, uh, refers to the uses of CCTV, so basically what they're talking about in this particular case is police monitoring cameras uh, have been used in Vancouver, and certainly I'm aware of their use in Kelowna previously. Um, in high crime areas. What are your feelings around those and uh, privacy impact assessments and what do you know about potential use here in the Penticton area? Uh, from a policing perspective, video is very valuable. Uh, there's a lot of different talks whether or not it actually um, reduces crime. If it doesn't reduce crime, it certainly helps us to solve it. The, the question is who controls it? So if you have video in your business or in your home, and something were to happen, it's very helpful for us to get that video, especially as more and more we move forward, it's much more high quality video that we can use for court. The, the members of the detachments that, that serve the, the South Okanagan and Similkameen know the majority of the people that are causing crime or social disorder. So even though we may not have evidence of a crime, they, if they broke into a, a residence or into a business, it's very likely that the members are going to recognize that person and then we can move forward with charges. The question from a privacy impact assessment is who owns that video? So a police officer sitting watching a video, probably not going to fly, but a community, a city, or a business that's doing that, that's something that we can start to look forward to and use that video. Okay, thank you. Well, I was going to add that we do have video uh, 
cameras in some of our locations at schools, and we have used uh, some of those tapes to assist us and the RCMP in solving some of the uh, property crimes and mischief that we have had. And uh, with the improved technology, I just see uh, that that um, evidence become even more beneficial because it's uh, becoming a bit more clear and concise around uh, being able to see images. Thanks, Wendy. Uh, Superintendent, can you explain or explore the usage, and I know you used some statistics here tonight that were put together by an analyst, but can you explore the usage of advanced analytics on crime data to detect patterns and trends and potentially to forecast key areas where you may want to increase patrols or coverage? And so do you want to go and explain the role of the analyst further and how it affects the district and subdivision, et cetera? Uh, certainly. So we do have a full-time analyst for the regional detachment, and then we have an army of analysts as you go up. So at the district office, which is responsible for the entire southeast, there's two analysts. And then we have a, an, an entire analyst section at headquarters. And they work very much in concert with each other. Uh, it, it's probably the, the, best, um, or the best description of what an analyst does is the calls that you call in and that we respond to, that's what our analyst is going to be looking at. So when I hear comments like, oh, we don't call the police anymore, they never show up. That doesn't really help. If you're worried about crime occurring or social disorder occurring in your neighborhood, even if we don't come because we are driven by a priority base, based response system, we're still tracking that. Our analyst is bringing that, that call in and looking at it. So if it's a mischief call or a, a suspicious person, she's looking at that. And when she starts to collect all of that, all of these calls start to form what we call a hotspot. And she will bring that forward. Every two weeks, we have a comp stat, which stands for comparative statistics. And she will present exactly where the things are happening. So if you don't call, or if the public doesn't call, she won't know about it. We're probably not going to send a police car. If she sees that there's a bunch of bikes being stolen in a certain 100 block of a certain city, and we've received a number of calls, it's going to come as a big red spot on her map and that's gonna get cars patrolling. It might not be marked cars. It might be a target enforcement unit in their unmarked cars looking and waiting for that person to strike next and get them. So those comparative statistics and those analytics are absolutely vital for us. And I just can't say it enough. If something's happening that concerns you, say something and give us a call. Thank you. Next question appears to come from someone self-identified in the uh, farmer ranching community. And let me advance here very quickly. Um, we've sort of, I've sort of paraphrased here. The, the first section basically talks about the announcement, a statement you provide around minor offenses, such as theft from vehicle not be attended by police. I think you've addressed that early on. And if you, if you want to go back to that, certainly you can. But I think the question that comes out really in uh, 3.1 of the first question here is, where is the line drawn between this type of offense and higher level property offense. Where do you draw that line? Uh, as I mentioned with the, the comment about the analyst, we, any call that we receive, if you call whether it's 911 or emergency or a non-emergency number and a file is created, the dispatcher or the complaint tanker will give you that file number. Once that file number is created, that means a police officer is coming. And that might be an actual police car rolling to your location or it could be the police officer giving you a call and saying what happened. So if it was, for instance, a theft from vehicle, your car was unlocked and you left your wallet there, you came in the morning and it was gone, unlikely that a police car is going to come. But you are going to talk to a police officer or one of our staff to get the details and to get the information, for instance, your credit card numbers, your driver's license number, so that we can put that on our system. In terms of not responding to those lower level crimes, that, that's all priority based. If we have something very um, a violent situation or like the fires in the fire in Kaledin last summer, every police officer is going to be responding to that. That's priority one. So it might take us some time, what we would call a priority three, a crime that's occurred, no suspects, no witnesses, no evidence rem remaining. That's going to be a priority three or a four. So it may take some time for us to respond to that, but there will be a response in that case. So what, where we draw the line 
is based on priority. So priority one calls are almost always in progress or a crime against the person in progress. So you see us an assault occurring, we're coming with our lights and sirens. A robbery, that's when a police car turns on its lights and sirens. A serious accident or motor vehicle collision or any type of property crime in progress. Somebody's in my driveway trying to break into my car. 911 and get us rolling. And our response time in Penticton for a priority one call is under 10 minutes. And that's a standard, a fairly um, provincial standard for all police departments. Our response time for a priority four could be a day. Because it's just, it's not a priority that needs a police car to come, but we do want to respect that you want to talk to a police officer. So it, it's all a priority base. So the, the line isn't really a, a line in the sand. It really is about the priority of that particular call. Thank you. And the next part of the question really deals with reasonable force and may be driven by certain media pieces that are coming out of the province of Saskatchewan recently. Uh, and the question is very, can you please clearly uh, let us farmers know our rights when it comes to protecting our families, property and livelihoods. And I realize that may be a tough question. It might have been better for someone from Crown Council because I know this is argued from the policing perspective in the courts on a daily basis around reasonable force. But if you have some enlightenment, what would that be? Uh, yeah, I guess the, the first thing, uh, the first caveat is I'm not a lawyer. My, my brother-in-law is a lawyer and I still talk to him. And it's, a, um, it's very difficult to give that. So I'm not going to give advice on what constitutes reasonable force. What I will say is a police, a Mountie goes to depot for six months straight and then for the next six months when they come to Penticton or to Summerland or to um, Princeton, they're under the immediate supervision of a senior constable. And by immediate, I mean they're driving around in the same car together and they're, they're constantly being assessed. And then they report to a corporal for the rest of their time as a constable who reports to a sergeant who reports on up a great deal of supervision. We qualify every year on our um, use of force intervention options. We qualify every year on um, our intervention management model. We, every three years we go for a, a week-long intensive course in Chilliwack to ensure that all of our use of force and our <laughs> intervention options are up to snuff and that we're obeying the law, which is a constantly moving target. So for me to say what is reasonable force, Police make mistakes. That's why we have the Independent Investigation Office. That's why we're so um, concerned about ensuring that when we do an investigation into one of our own that it's accurate and complete. So there really is no definition of reasonable force. It's very much based on a situation. What I can say, the danger of, oh, I think my computer died. I, I think that the danger of trying to assess that and to, to create a, um, a level, so someone breaks into my house, can I shoot that person? I would say no. If someone breaks into your house, if someone breaks into my house and I'm not on duty, I'm turning on the lights, I'm calling 911, which is the most powerful thing that you can do because that gets us rolling, code three with our lights and sirens, and I'm protecting my family. And probably the best way that I'm protecting my family is getting them out the back door because I don't want to deal with that. That said, the vast majority of people who would do anything like that that are trying, and I do mean the vast, like 99.99% of people that are breaking into a house, if they find out it's occupied, they are fleeing as fast as they possibly can. And that's still the time to call 911. So I hope that answers the question, but I would just say the, the um, best reasonable force is to get the people that have got a great deal of training in that aspect, and that's the police, and call 911 and get us coming. Great, thanks. So like we talked about before, there's always technical challenges. So I believe your battery did die in the laptop, but that's okay. Um, you folks, we had about 50 of these that were handed out when you came in. So basically, what, just so you know, we're going to follow along with these questions at least, you know, until about 8.30. So I'm going to carry on with the questions. I don't think we necessarily need them up on the board. You folks can follow along in your reference manual there. Like I said, I'm going to paraphrase because some of them are kind of long. We'll move on to question four. Um, Superintendent, when an RCMP employee is away for medical leave, stress leave, parental leave, or some other form of leave, does someone come in from head office to replace that person, or do we get credited for the time they were missing? And I, I think this question really is focusing around roadable resources. What does that look like? How does that change versus what's the impact on the budget when they're, when they're here or not here? 
Right. So like any industry, there's always going to be a, a vacancy pattern. So we usually go with about 10%. So in the case of the RCMP, if someone isn't here, so we would call it a hard vacancy. So for instance, Penticton funds 46 police officers. And if there's only 44 going through the door, that means we have two hard vacancies. In that case, Penticton is not paying for those police officers that are not here. There's a, a whole funding um, formula that we use. So they're paying a little bit to, to hold that position, but they're not paying the, the salary. In average, it's about $150,000 a year per police officer. That includes salary dollars and equipment and all of the other things that are associated to running the police force. So if that member isn't there, then they're not paying that salary, and that's uh, a cost saving. So in terms of a soft vacancy, so that's someone who's, on, for instance, on parental leave, sometimes we can get somebody to backfill that position it all depends on how many people we're hiring and how many people are coming out of depot um, that we can bring in to backfill that position. But a parental leave now could be up to 18 months so with the new legislation. So it is very possible that we would try to backfill that person so that when they do come back to duty, um, they'll take up another spot. So no, there isn't a big um, group that would come in to backfill, but our contract partners don't pay either when that person is there. Thanks for that detail. It's kind of complex, but it, I'm sure it sort of will, will color rate some of the situation for some people. Uh, I apologize at this point. I'm apologizing to some of the other members of the panel, but your time will come. Your time will come. Um, it will. <laughs> question five is, how can the average person assist the police in stopping crime? And in a particular case, they made a reference to trespassers entering an apartment building and camping out, but I think there may be a, a more general answer. How can you help out? I, I think just what I had on the slides um, in the earlier presentation, be a good witness. Join Block Watch. Block Watch is an incredibly powerful crime prevention opportunity. That's when everybody, just as the mayor said, when you're looking out and meeting your neighbors and looking out for each other. In my old house, I always used to leave my garage door open. I'd get a text or a phone call from my neighbor, Mark, dead. Garage door's open. Close it. And I would close it. And he's looking out for me. And I would do the same thing for him and our other neighbors. It works. And you know what your cars look like. You know who belongs in your neighborhood, and if you see someone that doesn't fit, just by opening your blinds and staring at that person, if they're a bad guy, they're gonna keep right on going. They're not going to victimize your neighborhood. If they are starting to stay, so for instance, the trespass, if someone's trespassing into a, a locked apartment building, that's a break and enter, call us and we'll come. And if they're actually there, call 911 and we'll come right away because it's in progress. If you open the door and let that person into your apartment building, most stratas have rules that you shouldn't be doing that. That's a whole other issue. Now you've invited that person in and there's very little that we can do other than attend and ask that person to leave. Thank you. Question, oops, sorry. Sorry, Manfred. Yeah, just to follow up on that, uh, it's so important that uh, you know the people who are in your neighborhood and uh, one of the ways to get to know your neighbors in the community is by having block parties. And I know it sounds maybe a little bit ridiculous, but the uh, South Okanagan Community Foundation gives out grants for community events and block parties do fall under that category. Uh, in Kermias we had four block parties last year, I went to three of them. And it is amazing how many people you thought you knew in your community when you go to these blog posts to realize, my God, I've never seen these people before. And that is one way of talking about safety, security. You have people who are snowbirds who are not in the community at the time, so the neighborhood is looking out for these uh, buildings or for the car. Or often, you know, in the summer you walk home, you notice that your neighbor's uh, uh, car window is not rolled up. So you ring the bell because you know the people and say, hey, do you realize that your car is uh, uh, unlocked or the window is down? Or you forgot your laptop on the front seat, you know? And that does happen when you are in a hurry. So uh, one of the ways to do this is by having block parties. It's uh, not just fun, it's also good for the community. Thank you. I think there's another question that'll focus on that a little bit later on here as well. Can I just add something as well? Sure. Um, so it used to be when I was taking criminology or guest lecturing, uh, that if you keep your neighborhood really orderly and tidy, that it shows that you're, you're kind of on it. Is that still the same? Is that a crime deterrent? Absolutely. So we would call that, it comes from New York Police Department, broken windows theory. 
So if you, you have, it, it just revolves around the appearance. So if, the, if you have a bunch of tags and you don't cover them up, or a bunch of graffiti and you don't paint it up, or if you have literally broken windows or dirty yards, that is the signal to people, whether it's on the social disorder spectrum or the criminal spectrum, that this is a place where I can, I can target, that I can thrive, because nobody's going to, they don't care about their own property, so they're certainly not going to care about me. So it definitely works. It's Broken Windows 101, and that's one of the things that we want to implement with Blockwatch and with some of our community-based programs. Thank you. Uh, I know you're not a home and business security consultant, sir, but the uh, next question comes up on video cameras again, just talking about the, uh, the value. Is it worthwhile having vi video cameras inside a building? If the person's concerned, you know, if you have them, how many do you need in that expense? So is it worthwhile having them? Uh, absolutely. So it's very, from solving crime, video is very important. You're right, I'm not a security consultant, so that, that is what we would recommend, is to get a professional in there to put the cameras in the right place. But they are very, maybe not to deter, and, and certainly in an apartment building, if there's a big sign that says you're on camera, very unlikely that someone's gonna open that door, or at least try to breach that door. They may have it open for them, which is a different discussion. But yes, cameras are very useful and very helpful for us. Question number seven, for those that can read it here, obviously it's someone that might be a little bit frustrated. Uh, it asks, are you reaching out to Stratas and the public? And I think certainly that's answered by having this forum here about what crimes they are facing, and that's the reason for the questions. Uh, the statement in the question really is more of a statement, but some of us have given up trying to contact police. And I think you've touched on this before, but really the question that comes out of this is what level of crime will you send out a police car for? Every level of crime. It just might be on a different um, priority. So reaching out to Stratas, yes, we do have a community policing section. Um, they're in the back there, you saw their display, and they, I think, almost 50 different community talks last year, going to different strata, seniors organizations, um, different building departments or building um, associations to give them some of these um, options and some of these ideas for how to deal with that. Um, certainly in terms of crime, if, if you call the police, in one way or the other, we're going to respond. And if we're not, if you do have an example where we haven't responded when you called, then I need to know about that. Either coming to our office, meet me at Coffee with a Cop once a month, sending an email, and we are going to be creating a Penticton RCMP, or sorry, a Penticton South Okanagan Smell Community Regional Detachment RCMP address, email address that you can send your questions into and that is coming, so I just need to know about that. But yes, any crime that's out there, if you see something then, and you get a file number, then that will elicit a response, whether it's an actual police car coming or a phone call to make sure that we're tracking that. Thank you. I think a question that's numbered here, it's under crime statistics, it's numbered as question 12, but it, I think it looks at basically stats can, uh, numbers for crimes, and deals with what was published last year, but the question comes out of this, are statistics gathered differently here versus Kelowna, when they talk about which has a severity index rating of 34 versus 146 in Penticton. Um, the question specifically, is it about manpower or is it a lack of the management of the resources? Uh, no, it's not about manpower or necessarily the management of the resources. That's something that we are working on in terms of our deployments. So we've restructured the detachment, so that's much more regional and much more responsive. So some of the things that we're doing, so that's the management side. In terms of the statistics, uh, every police department in British Columbia gathers statistics in the same man manner. Um, I forget the name, Uniform Crime Reporting. The UCR statistics is the, the structure that we use, which is national, and that's from Statistics Canada. So we're all s capturing in different ways. The crime severity index, which is where I, I think some of the issue comes with, with that. A certain news magazine reporting this as the 16th most dangerous community, Penticton in particular, in Canada, is to me a, what's a nice way to say this? A, a quite a misrepresentation and an indication to me that the person who wrote that article doesn't understand how crime statistics work. So CSI is Crime Severity Index, so it is associated to the sentencing and the type of crime. In Penticton and in the South Okanagan and Smilkameen, we do have issues with property crime, especially those types of crimes that I talked about in terms of theft from auto, 
mischief, which might not be an actual property crime. It could be that person lying on your front lawn that you want out of there. And many of those things are not chargeable, are charged, I should say. They're chargeable, but we don't charge because we resolve it in a different manner. In the case of the higher end crimes, like break and enter into a residence, that tends to have a higher score on the CSI. So when we have a spike in break and enters to residents, our CSI will go up. When we have a spike in all of you and all of our communities calling because we want you to call, our CSI will go up, because it, regardless of whether someone was apprehended. So that's not necessarily a bad thing. What I take exception with is the word dangerous. Dangerous if you're an iPad sitting on someone's front seat in an unlocked car. If you're walking downtown Penticton or Summerlin on a, or a Soyuz, is it dangerous? No. That we don't, our violent crime rate is incredibly low in, in the entire South Okanagan Similkameen corridor. Doesn't mean that we don't have violent crime occurring, but it's ex incredibly low for a community of this size, and it's something that we're going to continue with your help to target. Thank you for bringing some clarity to a very clouded subject, even for some yes. police officers, because I'm sure this could go on for a whole day. We could have a session just on that. Um, the next question really talks about uh, questions policing equal to show of force and I, I'm sensing by the topic they're talking about officer presence rather than a, a so, show of physical force leading to charges. Uh, they dealt with a, they're, they're making reference to a statement that I think you talked about as being false, publicly stated that the RCMP is powerless or no longer respond to calls for low crimes. Um, there, there's some other narrative text that goes on but basically um, the question at the end comes, say, t comes up at the end saying, going forward, how will the RCMP correct the image problem and present a, so they say show of force or increase, I'm guessing, officer presence in their communications so that all criminal, uh, criminality will be investigated and, you know, no crime is too small, no call is too small. So how, how are you going to take those steps? Well, I, I think it's important to say that all crime is investigated. It, that doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to be successful in that investigation. Um, and that it has a lot to do with evidence and with our partnership with the, co the criminal justice system and our partnership with the people at the table here in terms of knowing who we're dealing with. So it is important to investigate. Sometimes those investigations don't re reveal the results that we want. In terms of the, I guess that's the call, or as the writer wrote the show of force, you're right, it's about community engagement. And those are things that we're doing by increasing our, our visible patrols. And I, I would give a caution on visibility. I prefer engagement, and I prefer the prolific offender management that we're targeting the places that they're at. The, the visibility part, so that marked police car goes rolling down a downtown street, and it's the same reaction that I bet all of you have had when you went past the speed trap. The bad guy looks, the car goes by, and now he's free to do whatever it is. Maybe he's drinking a beer, maybe he's doing a deal, maybe he's getting ready to do a break and enter. He knows that the police car can't went by and it's probably not coming again for a little while. Just like when you roll by that speed trap on the Coquihalla where there's five guys shooting a laser beam and you go, oh man, no cops still Kelowna, I'm out of here. And you're going, because you, you know that it's not there. So we have to be very careful with visibility. Visibility does create a sense of safety and a, a sense of comfort. So for that reason alone, it's worth it for us to have those patrols out there and have those police cars going, and we're going to do that this year. But in terms of stopping crime and fighting crime, your eyes and ears are far more effective in reporting that and getting us to the right place at the right time. Thank you. Uh, number nine, the comments are generally very positive. As a matter of fact, overall positive uh, for you and for the RCMP. Uh, but really there is a question that's sort of borne out uh, for public agencies in general, but certainly the RCMP, this question's focused. Uh, it's kind of trend versus perception. So do you feel that there is a, train, a changing trend uh, in the public to show less respect and appreciation for the RCMP? And if so, are you doing anything to try to counter that? Maybe other agencies might be feeling the same thing, public agencies, but I'll turn that to you first. Sure, I'll take it first and then hand it over. I, I think generally in society we see some of that, some of our um, different age categories, different, um, whether it's a respect for people of different cultures or respect for different institutions, we do see that. But our responsibility, certainly as the RCMP, is to address that. And if we do, if we're not reaching out to a certain group, then we want to ensure that we're doing that. In terms of our own detachment rep, rep reputation 
yeah, that's what we're here for tonight, is to start to look at that and to get that community engagement. And again, if we're not doing something right, I need the community to tell me so that we can start to address some of those issues. And I don't know if anyone else has that same experience, but. Sure. Well, <clears throat> sorry, we work with a very vulnerable uh, demographic as uh, Ted alluded to earlier. And these are people that are entrenched in, <clears throat> in living on the streets, entrenched in addictions and survival sex work. And what we've seen with the RCMP in making um, these individuals feel that they're not gonna be targeted as criminals, that they need support, uh, that we need to work with this, with a cast, with the multiple agencies, um, so that we have the no wrong door approach. We have to remember that these are everyone's children, mothers, brothers, and sisters. So what we're seeing is something that um, not often, I think, the relationship with the RCMP is, and that's working with the agencies with respect and compassion to a very vulnerable uh, demographic. So uh, we're looking forward to working with the RCMP with these individuals because, as many of us know, uh, they are our family members. So um, I think we're starting off on the right foot and uh, doing a good job thus far. Anna? Well, I do want to say that uh, in the past year, we've had a, uh, an improved working relationship with the RCMP around our vulnerable youth. So from a school perspective, uh, we want all of our youth in school being successful, completing graduation. And we know that uh, over the last few months, we've had a small group of youth who aren't connected to school, who are getting into um, trouble in the community because uh, they lack supervision and they are vulnerable youth. So again, it goes, go, it comes back to meeting as uh, community partners with everyone at the table, Ministry of Children and Families, Interior Health, around how we support the youth and break that cycle uh, of the behavior that they're demonstrating and get them turned around. And quite often that could be uh, living arrangements, it could be counseling, it could be uh, drug counseling with uh, Daryl and Pathways. So it's a team approach. And uh, I would say that our, our community groups know who those youth are. And I think the other uh, push that we've seen from a youth perspective, um, and I congratulate uh, our community, um, South Okanagan Community Foundation and our youth is uh, the Yes Project, Youth Engagement Strategies, and uh, the successful work of our host agency used to be PDCRS, but it's now One Sky uh, in securing funding for the Foundry, which is uh, going to provide wraparound services for our vulnerable youth. So I think those are two key projects that have been um, a focus in our community that will certainly have an impact on some of the social, emotional issues for, for youth. Thanks. Thank you. Hi. Um, I have noticed that there has been a, a change in the RCMP when it comes to the vulnerable sector, especially when the, with the overdose crisis and what's happening there. People weren't calling 911 when there was an overdose for fear that they would be arrested um, or something else would happen. But now word is getting out there that it's okay to call 911, that the, the RCMP are there to help you, to assist you, to take you to where you need to go. And they have been. We have had RCMP officers that have brought some of our clients to Pathways when they have been in, in um, a certain state. And so the relationship is building and people are starting to notice that for sure. Yeah, I, I, I can't speak specifically to attitudes towards the RCMP, but just in general, there seems to be a theme of frustration and pushing back uh, from marginalized populations for good reason, for, for multiple reasons. And uh, there's many layers to it uh, that include that there's, mo there's numerous substances on the street that uh, are having people um, uh, acting in ways that they wouldn't normally act. Um, and uh, there's, there's multiple layers of uh, stigma and discrimination uh, uh, wherever, wherever they're going in the community. And uh, th those, those things are really 
creating a level of uh, frustration and pushback that I think really makes sense. Um, and so some of this work that's happening uh, right now, I think, is really helping to uh, normalize uh, mental health and substance use as healthcare issues and to kind of address some of the, the uh, housing issues as well that I, when we're seen as a community uh, coming together, uh, that, that, that is um, felt by marginalized populations in, in, a, in a different way and hopefully that will alleviate some of the pushback that we're experiencing. Thanks, Con. Just to give everybody an update here, it's, uh, we're looking at quarter after eight, and I want to be respectful for everybody's time, but um, we're on question 10 of about 30 questions, and there are some multi-point ones, and I, I think, a lot, I'm hoping, uh, knowing what questions are coming, that there's a lot of questions here that want to be asked by the community, but I'm, what I'm going to probably suggest we do now is I'm going to kind of accelerate and jump through some of the questions so we actually get to a, an open mic period where we'll then give you that 30 seconds to ask your own question if it hasn't been asked. So I'm going to try to go through these. You can try to keep up with me and skim along. I'll give you a bit of a hint where we're at here along the way as we go. So um, number 10 was a, uh, basically a question that sounded like a person that had some concerns. Uh, and, but they state, we obviously need the RCMP as part of the justice system and it'd be too expensive to replace the police with a new force. Therefore, um, uh, I think uh, aside from money and more training, I think this question, I'll skip over the first one on improving community relations because I think we talked about uh, a lot about that. What are you going to do, or you're looking, this is internal looking, sir, to improve the performance and the attitudes of locally serving officers and office personnel, if that's an issue or a concern? Well, and if it is a concern, then we certainly need to know about that and what some of those specifics are, I, I would be interested in that. So the, the fifth uh, priority that we had on our annual performance plan is our people. And that's exactly what we're looking at doing, is improving whatever we can do to improve our performance and our engagement to the public is something that we want to do. And that applies to all of our employees, not just the regular members, so that you have a very good experience when you come to the detachment and so that you have a very good experience when you're on the phone. And when you call 911 or when you call the non-emergency line, you're not always talking to someone here in the South Okanagan, you're talking to our dispatch center and they, in Kelowna, and they are also working very hard to improve that experience. So that's something that we're, it's a, a continuous development that we want to focus on. Thank you. Um, there's a question that comes up, but I think it's partway down through this series. What will you do to protect other communities, such as OK Falls, who are dependent? Now the comment here is a negative one, and you're less than sterling service. And I think that's about resource allocation, so I think that one's solely yours. Yeah, no, and that's something with the reorganization of the detachment and something that we're continuing to do. So when a community such as Summerland or Penticton or Asoyas who pay for their own policing has a certain amount of police, they expect those police to be deployed in their community. By the same token, police that are provincially funded are expected to be in our provincial areas such as Caledon and Okanagan Falls. In this detachment, we have an integrated model, so we call it a post-dispatch. It doesn't matter who's working. If a call comes in in Caledon, a member's coming, whether that's a Penticton paid member by the position number that they're in or whether that's a provincial member. My job is to ensure that that's equitable so that 46 police officer years worth of policing are delivered in Penticton and that an appropriate amount is delivered in those provincial areas. And we do that not just with the patrol element, but we also do it with our specialized teams such as our general investigation section that investigates major um, high-end crimes such as uh, aggravated assaults, that sort of thing, and with our target enforcement unit, which is a mix between municipally funded and provincially funded people so that we can move back and forth. So that's how we try to address some of those issues. Okay, anybody else? Um, the next point here I think is probably, so I'm going to give the panel fair warning, the next point here is probably one that we might look across the panel. Uh, because it's going to be addressed to the superintendent first. Though you do not see your role as being that of social services, it seems that these types of calls are being pressed into your overview. What, if anything, do you tend to do to continue to answer the call to service? And, and that's something that we struggle with with all of our members. We're not social workers, and that doesn't mean that we don't have compassion. That doesn't mean that we don't have people with skills and experience in that area. But I wear handcuffs on my, my belt to arrest bad guys, and that's what we're good at doing. And that's what we're expected to do. And I, I don't know that that necessarily transforms into social um, service or into mental health, but we need to be able to recognize those different 
causal factors. And then we need to work with our partners to get them to the place where they need to be. Because my cell block is probably not a good solution to someone who's suffering from a mental illness. But we do have people that can help. So that might be the route that they go, but at the end of the day, we need to get them the help that they need. Yeah, I think it's, it's everyone's responsibility. Uh, SOWINS provides assistance primarily to women and women and their children fleeing abuse. Uh, and violence, we've now got a public safety funded program, so federal money for five years to work with those that are street entrenched, that are doing survival sex work and addictions and suffering mental uh, health issues. It's everyone's issue, so we've responded by working with the RCMP, with Pathways, with Interior Health Authority to try and meet the needs, a wraparound approach, working with BC Housing on supportive housing. When we see individuals that are living on the street, uh, the only way to get them off the street is to work together in a collaborative and a collective approach and get them the, the help that they need. And so that's what we're all trying to do and that's why we're here. This is our community as well, but we own it. We have a responsibility, every one of us, to assist in, uh, in assisting these individuals. The K-12 system really is um, focusing on early intervention and proactive teaching proactive skills to youth. So I mentioned uh, the youth engagement strategy and uh, the, the foundry that will be up and running within the next uh, 12 months. But we do a variety of things in schools around teaching children how to recognize when they're experiencing anxiety uh, we, we do a lot of work around uh, mind up curriculum in K to 8, and that's uh, giving kids the skills to identify anxiety and uh, learning strategies that will help them reduce that anxiety. We spend a lot of focus on uh, social emotional learning so that we're developing kids who are resilient. And uh, we've had a real focus on growth mindsets, so it's, it's okay to fail at things. Um, there's not just one way to get something done. Uh, part of the challenge is trying something and failing and learning by our failures and continuing to keep trying and to keep growing. And so a lot of our work is around uh, proactive, uh, developing proactive kids in our community. However, we do have kids who come to school every day who witness trauma. And so we've uh, tried to build capacity in our teaching force around uh, working with uh, kids, trauma-informed practice, how we connect with kids in the classroom with empathy and compassion around understanding uh, some of the things that some of our kids come to school with every day. And uh, we also connect with child and youth care workers. We have child and youth care workers in our, in our high schools and middle schools. We uh, have a partnership with Pathways, and we have uh, youth workers who identify and work with at-risk kids in middle schools. They run workshops in high schools. We provide uh, all sorts of wraparound services for kids depending on what their specific needs are. And we couldn't do that without the support of our community partners because really our mandate's K-12, to but we know um, education in K-12, to but we know if kids are uh, coming from an abusive home, they're hungry, or there's other uh, factors that are impacting their ability to learn, they're not gonna learn in school. So the first thing we have to do is make sure that they're feeling safe, that they're fed. And I think the most important thing, not just for kids, but anybody in our community, is that uh, until they have a sense of belonging, we're not gonna have a positive impact on them. So that just doesn't go for kids, that goes for adults and seniors. And so we do a lot of intergenerational work of trying to connect kids with, with adults and seniors in the community. And that hopefully fosters a sense of safety with, with some of those folks. Uh, one example where a whole community became involved is in Kermius. We have uh, just outside of Kermius a um, care facility for young people between the ages of uh, 18 and 24 uh, um, on drug addictions. Now the whole community uh, took part in this, takes part in this. We have the garden club going out there and showing these young people how to grow vegetables. 
for example. We have uh, the fire department going out there and showing them how firefighting works and how the fire service works. We have the school involved, we have the RCMP involved, we have our recreation uh, commission involved going out there and talk about exercise and as part of a healthy feeling and mental health in, in terms of uh, recreation. And uh, one other uh, program I wanted to mention since we talk about RCMP is the DARE program. Uh, local government has been very supportive of the DARE program, which is a really important program that we start our small uh, youth, our upcoming youth, uh, on the right path right away. And uh, every year when there is a DARE graduation, uh, I'm very happy to uh, congratulate these young people because they're very proud of what they've learned in terms of uh, avoid alcohol, smoking and drugs. So. There's uh, many ways a community get involved, can get involved, uh, whether it's um, donations or the examples I just uh, brought up. So, uh, just one of many, many issues. Yeah, that's a, that's a great example. And, and uh, I just want to kind of reiterate quickly what everyone has kind of touched on, which is that nobody owns mental health and substance use or social well-being in general. That, uh, and in fact, if you know, interior health has a lead role to play in that, but uh, um, it, it really is unrealistic and in, ineffective to uh, approach it in, uh, in, in any uh, singular way. Um, in fact, there's many community partners that can do things much better than interior health can do. <laughs> um, very innovative community partners. Uh, and. Um, and, and, and not only community partners, but families uh, and, and small, smaller communities. Uh, there's a, a significant role for, uh, for everyone to play. And we're really hearing more from, from the province and from our local health authorities around the need to do more of that. And so we're going to be seeing more of that. We're going to be expected to work more closely with our communities, uh, including our local uh, GPs, in ways that we haven't before. And, and uh, I think that's really encouraging news, the, the, the direction uh, we're being given uh, to do more of that type of work. So, Thank you very much uh, for, to the entire panel. As a member of the community, I'm certainly excited, if I may, you know, that whole idea of the cast team coming forward, uh, uh, coming to the table and everybody coming together to work to put your energies together, I think is a very positive thing. Seen it work in other communities and looking forward to seeing some positive results here in this community. Sir. How will you locally address the important matter of reconciliation? That's certainly been in the public lens across the country between nations and cultures, uh, as much as it's dependent on the behavior and actions of yourself and your officers within the community. And I guess this kind of focuses towards uh, bias-free policing and your thoughts on that. Well, I think that's exactly it. It's bias-free policing and bias-free community service for all of us. So. We, we are guided by our core values in the RCMP, so compassion, integrity, honesty, professionalism. Um, the, the respect is a, a big part of that, that we respect all cultures and all people, regardless of their, their background, regardless of the traumas that they may have experienced, regardless of their current situation, even if that includes criminality. So we are certainly a, geared towards that bias-free policing. It, I mentioned earlier that we're a national police force, so we do have some of those policies, and that is one of them that the RCMP is striving to attain. And it starts right from our cadets going to depot, is recognizing people of various cultures and of various backgrounds, and addressing that and ensuring that we provide them the best service that we can based on compassion and an understanding of who they are. Thank you. Uh, number 11 uh, starts off with three sort of negative points, but it's a quick question at the end, and I'm sure you've covered it off, or I recall something coming up in the presentation, but I'll, I'll ask the question if you want to summarize very quickly. Are there any suggestions or advice for property and business owners in terms of dealing with petty crime, vandalism, drug transactions, and other desirable crimes? And the see something, say something kind of rings in my mind, but I'm not sure if there's anything else that you want to add to that. Well, that's a big part of it, and certainly that gets to our um, report crime. Report things that you see, and if you're concerned, then give us a call so that we can come, whether it's the non-emergency line 9 or 911 if it's in progress. We also have our community policing section that does crime prevention through environmental design. So when we're talking about businesses, 
um, they're certainly available to do that, to give some advice on what we can do to prevent crime from happening. So something as simple as putting up a gate or something as deliberate as a light or cameras in a certain area. So those programs are out there and I would encourage you to call us about that. Uh, question number 13 really deals uh, safe homes, safe communities and I think it was touched on earlier, Rod Manfred, you're the one that introduced that particular piece. Uh, it's put forward by a couple in their neighborhood and talking about getting together for neighborhood parties. Uh, and so out of that comes a question, um, can you, or can this idea of linking neighbours be further promoted around Penticton and if so, do you feel that's part of the solution? Absolutely, and that, that certainly speaks to what um, Mayor Br um, <laughs> Manfred <laughs> was saying, sorry, a little mind blank, blank there, um, has said that there, the Community Foundation does have some support for that, but what we would look at is block watch and whether that extends to a block party that would be great, but Block Watch for us is something that we're rolling out again. Um, crime, free, crime free multi-housing is another program that we're going to be putting out there so that people get to know their neighbors and get to know their, their part of their community so that they can prevent crime or some of those issues from, it, from involving them. Uh, question number 14 starts off, uh, I'm embarrassed that our police force is sending out the message that Penticton downtown is unsafe, but I know you've already addressed that early on and those are not your feelings and whether that's a misperception or a misquote. Uh, we get down through in the bottom, there is, a, there is a genuine question, but by holding this conference and focusing on crime, I wonder what you hope to achieve, so can you give some enlightenment there? Absolutely, what I hope to achieve by this and by some of our other outreach such as Coffee with a Cop is to hear is to hear what the, the community has to say and what our concerns are and what our issues are. And the, the start of that question that I would be embarrassed too if I said that because it, it certainly isn't how I feel. I think that this community, whether it's Penticton or Summerland or Princeton or wherever you're from, the, this whole corridor is outstanding and we have a lot to be proud of. I did a piece in one of the local media outlets um, about some of my background and what I believe in and some of the things, the tragedies that I've seen overseas and the trauma that people experience there and their courage and their ability to start over. We don't have to start over. We're already owning our property and owning our area. And we have an opportunity here as a community to not take back something that we never gave up, but we have an obligation as police officers and as a community to defend the, the I guess, the very many blessings and outstanding things that we have in our community and that's what we aim, hope to achieve by having these meetings and getting together. Thank you. Uh, what do you see as the most pressing problem? You talked about some statistics but what do you see as the most pressing problem around public safety in Penticton? Uh, well the most pressing problem certainly is perception of, of crime and, and what drives that. So do we have an issue with property crime in the South Okanagan, in the Okanagan corridor in British Columbia in general? Yes. And a lot of that is, is driven by some of the things that we've talked about, whether that's mental health or addictions, especially on that lower end, that those targets of opportunity. The, from a policing perspective, we have a, must maintain a very strong focus on prolific offenders. So the people that are career criminals, the 3% of criminals that cause 80% of the crime. That's what we're focused on from a social disorder perspective with our patrols and with um, CAST and with CSET, we're focused on some of those um, root causes that are causing those social issues, such as addictions and mental health and working with all of our partners to address that. Thank you. Um, there's another statement being made, but there's a question that follows it up. Uh, perhaps the real issue here is the number of transient, and it's specific, transient homeless people. Um, and this may we end up open to the panel here, is what would be a reasonable solution to what they deem is that problem? I think there's a lot of things happening, and I am going to ha hand it over here. The, the reality is, from both our statistics and from our partners, the, the majority of people who are truly homeless, and I, I do want to differentiate that homeless, being homeless from being a criminal, not the same thing. And too often, we make that association, and I don't think that that's fair at all. If the number, for instance, on our last count, 163 homeless in Penticton, the vast majority of them are from here or from the so South Okanagan. They're not being imported. We're not getting criminals sent on a bus from other areas or from other areas of the South Okanagan and staying here. There may be one or two, and that may happen, but this wholesale belief that 
crime or social disorder is being imported isn't really a, a fact when we talk about where our people are coming from. But there's so much that is being done to address that in terms of housing projects that are coming in. I'm, I'm sure that you've all read that on the, in the paper. CAST is a big part of that um, to address those issues. And if anyone else has, wants to say something about that, I'm not sure. Well, I do know that when people talk about the transient homeless, a lot of times they're referring to the people who come and pick fruit in our area. And I think a lot of that homelessness has to do with the fact that we do not have housing for them in the summertime when they come here to work. And so that's another area that's really important and needs to be looked at as well, is how can we help the people who are helping our farmers um, have a place where they can actually sleep comfortably and be able to take a shower and wash their clothes and uh, feel like they're actually part of our community. So that's what I think of the transient homeless when people talk about that. Um, people don't come to Penticton just to hang out and be homeless. Uh, like uh, Ted said, the majority of the people who are homeless here have been in Penticton for a long time. And, and I would just say, if you, if you do meet a transient homeless, uh, we treat them with compassion. And, and and they they have a right to be here. Uh, I'm I'm in the last ten years I've lived in four different jurisdictions in in Canada, and just because of my social economic status, I don't think that should afford me any more right uh, to be here than someone that is homeless. So, you know, there you you will run into some, and I think we should uh, greet them with compassion. Um, so this carries on from the first part of the question about the, uh, the life in the small Okanagan city. Uh, you've lived here for a while now. Uh, sir, what do you really think, and this is the final person's pr final point of the question, what do you really think of the quality of life in the small Okanagan city? I think it's outstanding except for the smoke last summer because I couldn't use our paddle boards. <laughs> and that was the, the big thing. Um, yeah, it, we came here for a reason. And like I said before, there's a reason that my wife and I moved here and there's a reason why I'm, if you weren't born here, you came here. It's beautiful, it's outstanding, it's safe, it's a, a great place to visit and bring our family and our friends, and that's what I love about it here. So we intend to stay for a while, and I, yeah, I can't say enough about it, except I live in a relatively small apartment and we get a lot of friends coming over, so we do have a aero bed, that, so that's what we have to use. So it's great, and I love it here. Thank you. Um, the question 15 uh, talks about some issues around dumping property, but really I think it's looking at is there a possibility of increased nighttime patrols and laneways behind the stores and the alleys? Yeah, and that's certainly part of the, the whole community. So uh, again, I live in very close to one of our thrift stores, and I see people coming at 3 o'clock in the morning and dropping off dressers with the veneer peeling and a bunch of old clothes with rips and tears that that agency can't sell anyways. And the reason they're doing it is because they don't want to pay the tipping fees at the dump. And for me, I find that, as a, a resident of this community, kind of offensive. So basically, you're unloading your garbage on another agency that's trying to help the people that are in need, whether they're low income or homeless or um, have from a, an addiction or something like that. So it just takes money out of the very charity they portray to be helping by dumping their garbage in the back gate. So I would encourage, again, as a community, to ensure that we're watching out for that. I certainly do from my apartment, and I, I kind of talk to the people that are doing that. And it's important that we're taking care of all of our, our people in the community. I'll just give a quick reflection just now. I'm, I'm conscious of the time. It's, it's 8.37. We're going to continue with the questions. Uh, we're on question 16 of 30. Uh, I hope you're finding some value in the answers that have been given by the superintendent and the panel. And we're going to continue as much as we can up to 9 o'clock, and we can make a call at 9 o'clock what we're doing. But we're going to continue with some of the questions that were sent in through the forum if some of you are wondering uh, what we're going to be doing here. So um, the next section talks about social order addictions and mental health. Uh, it says that I've read a lot of local citizen-led patrols acting outside of established programs or coalition with the police. The question really is, how does the RCMP view these citizen-led initiatives? 
So citizen-led patrols, they, they've heard some reporting in question 16, uh, out, acting outside of established programs or coalition with the police. How does the RCMP view these citizen-led initiatives? And perhaps that's to do with COP or that sort of thing. Right, I think that's the, the big part is, is getting people to volunteer and to become part of the, um, part of that solution. I called it partners in our own community safety. So anybody who wants to join that and be a part of that, that's absolutely vital that we encourage them to come and to be part of our, our patrols. Uh, car alarms, uh, we all know how desensitized people are. Uh, does anybody pay attention to car alarms? Again, it depends on where it is. So uh, a block watch type organization that everyone knows that, for instance, uh, somebody has a, a work truck that's full of tools and you can't take it out. I would expect that person to ensure that they get the best locks and the best protection that they can, but not everyone has a garage, so you can't necessarily store that. Then a person like that with a car alarm where his neighbors are, her neighbors all know that um, I've got some valuable stuff in there. That is a, a very effective deterrent in that case. Uh, car alarm in the middle of a parking lot, perhaps not so much. Uh, question number 18. A uh, question seems to be born a bit out of frustration if you actually read into the entire part of the question, but uh, what is the RCMP planning to do differently than from the last forum? And I guess really the question comes down to what's changed because we start talking about statistics and maybe that's a time just to reflect on what's changed since the last forum. Well, I think what's changed is our, our approach, developing CAST and CSET and some of that um, change in the way we work with our partners and, and building those partnerships. I think that's something that's been developed for, under development for quite some time and we've been moving forward with that. They get more specific here talking about the pot shop uh, and there seems to be, a, they're, they're sending to indicating there's some finger pointing here, all attempts to discuss this with the city always ends back to no support from the RCMP. So they're talking about finger pointing back and forth and uh, an indication they never felt safe in the area. Uh, so I guess if there is, is there a comment that you have to say about working together with the city around the pending legalization of marijuana and anything you can say around that? Yes, I think the, the RCMP is the city's police force and is the South Okanagan's police force. So we work hand in hand with them and we, we have to enforce the laws of the land and that's what we'll do. So currently the sale of marijuana is illegal and we'll take enforcement action as appropriate on that. When recreational marijuana becomes legalized, whenever that is, when, what that time frame is, then we'll support the laws of the land in the, the manner that we're expected to. Uh, question 19, I'll jump to that one. Uh, it says on the Facebook, they posted on Facebook in the past, the city did something about a particular problem, an appointment downtown decided to walk. So are there going to be, or are there no police doing beat work, at least walking the areas and pedestrians used to move about town? They're talking particularly in the downtown corridor. And as I, I mentioned before, there will be. That's gonna be a big part of what we're doing in terms of our proactive patrols. Question 20, I think we'll go to some of the other people on the panel as well, uh, talks about the number of, and I'm gonna change dysfunctional to vulnerable persons in Penticton increased in the last five years. So I think uh, if you want, if there's, does anybody have an answer to that specifically? Has there been an increase in vulnerable persons coming to the Penticton area by numbers? Well, I've only been here three and a half years. Um, what we do know from our services is that we're becoming more known uh, working with uh, all our sister and brother agencies, working with the city and BC Housing, et cetera, that the resources are becoming uh, more public and more known, so people are accessing services more. I don't know if it's on the increase, but I know access to services certainly is. And with the wraparound approach, we're able to provide, I think, uh, a better service by uh, the philosophy that there is no wrong door. So if someone does access our services but really needs to go to Pathways, then we can call Daryl and call her staff and we can uh, bring them over there, et cetera, or transport them over there and uh, make sure that they don't get frustrated on telling their stories over and over again. Oh, okay, well it's not much different than CAST actually. So it's where a group of individuals or agencies um, from those um, individuals from agencies or organizations working together so that we can provide um, a consolidated or collective uh, approach in assisting and supporting the individual. 
Well, I do know that uh, Penticton has a higher level of poverty than a variety of uh, communities in BC. And I think as the cost of renting or finding accommodation has increased, uh, when you have a limited budget and you have to choose between a roof over your head, um, hydro, lights, or food, uh, when it's summertime, it's a little easier to find a tent and stay outside. So I think there's a number of factors that have made it a bit more visible. And a lot of that is um, we live in a desirable area and uh, we have a lot more uh, folks moving to our area because it's affordable for some, but it's pushing out a lot of uh, the, the folks in our community. So I don't think they're coming from other communities. I just think that we have an affordable housing issue. And uh, I know there's been a lot of work uh, being done by BC Housing the city to address that. Question 21 uh, is, the city placed a variety of people in three hotels along Main Street in Penticton. Has this led to an increase in property crime, shoplifting, and vandalism in the immediate area? In some areas, yes, but that is only because these are um, in their infancy. So we find that when, once we work together, and that's exactly what CAST is all about, we can start to prevent that by engaging the people that are in those different um, facilities. And not all of it is about people that have addictions or, or mental health. Some of it is low income housing. And we certainly will be working with all of our partners in that as well. So to a certain extent, there's an, an, an initial impact, but we start to see that um, reducing once we start getting the calls and the, 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 the direction that we need to be in the right place at the right time. Question 22 is kind of long, and I think it really looks at uh, the, the criminal justice and the court system, but the question focuses on mandatory and closed rehab under the healthcare system. And so looking at a closed facility where people must go to receive some therapy. Um, do you agree in something we should be looking going that way? Because the question is, do you agree or disagree with a particular proposal that they should set this up and people should be made and, and forced to go into treatment? Well, from a policing perspective, we are big proponents of treatment on demand. Um, so when someone wants to have that help, then that we need a place to, to bring them. From the Charter and Rights and Freedoms, it doesn't matter if you're a millionaire on Naramata Bench or if you're an addicted homeless person living in a vulnerable position, your rights are exactly the same. So the police can't force somebody into treatment. That person has to have the supports to get to that. And I think there's people here that probably have a much better answer than I do. <laughs> you, if people aren't ready for change, you can't force them to go into treatment. They really need to have that mindset that they're ready to go. And so by having all of these different agencies working with them and working collaboratively with everyone and being in touch with them, especially the people who are homeless and making that connection with them, to be able to show them that we care and we support them and that we don't stigmatize them. Those connections are the ones when the light bulb will go off and they'll say, you know what, I would like to get some help. But to round them all up and force them to go to a treatment center is definitely not the answer. It does not work. So I, th I think this is a, this is a uh, provincial policy issue that falls under the Mental Health Act. Uh, because we, we, we do uh, um, uh, forcefully admit people in for mental health, but not substance use in, in some cases. Uh, and other jurisdictions within the country uh, approach that differently. And so I'm, I'm not going to take a position on, on whether we should do that or not, uh, but uh, rather focus in on accessibility and more, t more timely access to service. So as, as, as was stated, when people are indeed uh, ready uh, and open to uh, some service that we have timely access to that. Thank you. 23 is for the truly working homeless, would it be a good idea to support a low cost campground with toilet and shower facilities? Would that help what they view as the problem? Ted, I think that one's for you. Okay, okay I'll do that one. Uh, I, I don't know, I, I don't think so. I think the, the solution is, um, we, we do follow a housing first mentality, our philosophy, and it's important that we find effective and proper housing for people. And I think that's a much better solution 
solving the issue and maintaining that solution as opposed to just putting a Band-Aid on it. Okay. So pointed 124 is sort of a pointed one to you, sir, once again. Concerned about the availability of overnight policing in Summerland and maybe the supplies to other locations as well. The impression is that there's no officers in town to be called upon if needed. Uh, do the rash of home B&Es and, and nighttime robberies at businesses, will this staffing level be reviewed? And I think that's probably applicable to other areas in the, in the it, region. It is, and so any one of our areas. So a, a bigger center like Penticton has 24-hour policing. Some of our smaller areas do not, um, but we have members on call, and they're on an immediate, it's called operational readiness, so when the phone rings, they'll get dressed, they'll go. Um, that said, this is a regional detachment, so if there's something happening in Summerland, we have provincial members in Penticton that would answer the call if something's happening in Caledon. We saw that last summer with the fire in Caledon. There were people coming all the way from a Soyuz to assist with that. And lights and sirens and away they go. So we don't have boundaries. Um, we do in terms of funding and in terms of where the person does the priority and the majority of their policing. But when the call comes, we're coming. It doesn't matter where we're coming from, but we'll be there. Okay, question 25. Uh, the question is, how do you deal with the people who have severe mental health issues, and perhaps this person means uh, with mental health issues that are in crisis, tending towards violence and who live in rural areas. So how do you prioritize these calls? And it may be something open for the panel too, looking at what kind of response is available outside of the Penticton area. Well, certainly if it's a violence issue and if there are uh, potential harm to themselves or others, then that would be a priority one call and we would be coming. Our authorities under the Mental Health Act include apprehending someone who falls into that category and then taking them to the medical professionals. And where it comes from there, I think we can pass the mic down. That's good? Okay, sounds good. Uh, traffic enforcement, a matter close to my heart. Um, someone says you've been doing an excellent job with blitz on texting, texting kills. So there's a statement rather than a question. Uh, generally, number 27 asks for Eastside Road. Talks about comment on Motor Vehicle Act and regulation enforcement. Yeah, so part of our, our new structure with CSET, it does have uh, traffic specialists on it. And as a six-member unit, it can become a six-member traffic unit if that's the, the project that they're working on at that time. Right now, they're focusing on some of our social issues, um, but certainly into the summer and into the, the coming months and our, our enhanced patrols will be focusing on traffic. We have, in addition to what you see in our communities as your local police, we also have the South Okanagan Traffic Services, which is a separate unit that doesn't fall under my command, but is still very active throughout the South Okanagan, and they work out of our buildings. So there's members in Karen, are in Summerland. We just have a member that just started in Penticton Detachment, and she starts every shift by rolling around all the way through Naramata and that down East Side Road and onto the highway, even though her priority is the highway, that is their main duty. And we have members in Asoyuz, Karameas, and Princeton uh, from South Okanagan Traffic Services. So they will be focusing on that as well. Question number 28 is a simple question, but it goes on for a couple of sentences. So I'll, I'll reduce it. Why is there no speed enforcement whatsoever on the downtown Main Street stretch where the posted limit's 30 kilometers per hour? My sneaky answer is because of the big excavators in the middle of the downtown <laughs> core. But um, we will, and that, that's the same answer as with East Side Road. So our, not just our CSET, but every one of our members is capable of giving a, a ticket and doing that enforcement. And you will see that much more um, as we come into the summer months that we will be enforcing that 30 kilometer per hour speed limit. Number 29 talks about distractive driving, and you've already talked about those initiatives and the priority of that. Number 30, uh, asked the question that there was a new training directive issued to RCMP members around motorcycle enforcement and loud engines, so what action is the RCMP going to take on the matter of straight pipes uh, on, during the upcoming summer? Um, I, I prepared for, I knew that question was coming, so I talked to our traffic uh, members about that. It, it's a very difficult thing to do, so any kind of modifications that's done to a motorcycle or even a, a, a car for that matter, we, we do have authority under the Motor Vehicle Act to deal with that in terms of the modifications. So we could take the vehicle off the road. A, just by saying it has loud pipes, when many of the, the motorcycles come from the factory with those loud pipes, it's very difficult to um, do any kind of decibel readers. We don't have those um, in the community, and, and there's a lot of issues with that. For instance, you have to rev the bike up to 8,000 or 9,000 RPMs to get that, and the drivers get pretty cranky about that when the vehicle's not in motion. 
The other thing that we do when they are loud, it's probably because they're going fast. So the other solution is our other traffic enforcement um, techniques, such as using lasers and radar to, to track those bikes. So knowing where they are, um, in turn, helps us to target them in the right area. Uh, question 31 has multiple points, and to me, just by reading it, for those that can see it there, it definitely sounds to me like a retired Highway Patrol member that's asked these questions. So um, the first part is, what specifically does the RCMP have planned in 2018 to address the unacceptably high number of unlicensed drivers and uninsured vehicles operating our highways in the South Okanagan? Uh, again, I, I think it carries on from that. From our One of the things that we've worked on very hard in the past year is staffing our detachments up to full strength, and we're just about there. That allows us, in turn, to put um, enhanced patrols for specific things, such as doing just that. Just a couple, or about a month ago, our North Okanagan Traffic Services, working with South Okanagan Traffic Services, brought their ALPR, which is an automatic license plate reader, it's a police car that has an automatic license plate reader on top, and it, what one police officer can do by punching in plates, it can do hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of license plate reads as it's just driving down a street, and that will trigger um, any notification that the driver or the owner of that car is unlicensed, and then they'll take appropriate action. So it's a very effective tool, and we have access to that, and that's something that we'll be working on with our traffic people. The second part, it's multi-part, but it basically deals with improperly equipped motor vehicles, muffler infractions, and it's multi-point, but the question really is what specifically has the RCMP planned in 2018 to address the seemingly unacceptable high number of non-MVA compliant vehicles operating our streets? And I think they're talking about the Motor Vehicle Act regulations here, that's sort of linked to CVSA. Right, right. so we, we do work with CV commercial vehicle inspection um, to ensure that non-compliant vehicles are targeted. And certainly any member of this detachment, of this regional detachment, has the authority, if they see a vehicle that's not properly equipped or that is unsafe, to deal with that. Of course, we have our traffic specialists who are specialists in that area. And we will be making that most likely, judging by the amount of questions we had on traffic, that traffic safety will become one of our priorities this year as, as it was last year, and then continue to move forward with those enhanced patrols. That ends the... Uh, the formulated set of public questions that it came in, we're at 8.55, I sort of leave it to you to what direction do we want to go here? Sure, if there's just a one or two questions that we could ask, I, I noticed that several people left and that, that's unfortunate because they, the answer to their question might have just been offered. Um, but that, that's fine, I, I think we will continue to, if there is any last minute question, um, otherwise I think we've, it's been a, a long evening and I certainly appreciate you coming, so. Oh, I think there's one there. All I'll ask is the moderator, if I could just say as you're sitting now formulating whether you're going to ask a question, if you have one, if you can keep it to 30 seconds. If not, don't forget, I've got to hit this little button just out of respect for everybody's time here. So, sir, go ahead. I think, uh, first of all, I'd like to see policemen teaching people how to enter and exit uh, traffic circles, like at Memorial Center. That would really be a help. But I really think our society is too far gone. I mean, people really mean well, but... After you steal your third car, you should, you should be put to sleep. Honest to God, I mean, uh, I, I don't know why we do this. It just goes on and on, but we don't fix the problem. The guy selling these drugs, the people who peddle that stuff, they should be executed. They do it in a lot of other countries, and they don't have so much trouble. We've got to tighten it up, or we're going to lose the whole show here. Sir, do you, I, have a, do you have a question? Because uh, That's it. I don't want to take too okay. much time. Okay. Thank you for your comments, sir. Does somebody else have a question? We'll just ask you to go to the mic if you could. Just back to the mic for the lineup. Uh, I have a question, a practical question. I know the number of in, uh, addicted people and uh, homeless people is increasing in Penticton. So we have problems at the United Church in Penticton with needles, we have play school. And uh, what would the, uh, there's an expert on addiction here, what would you advise us to do to be humane and just and keep the fears of the elderly people, elderly secretaries in that church assayed in some way. What, what would you suggest that we do? I know that at the, at the school district level, uh, we've worked with Interior Health to provide resources to our teachers. So first and foremost, they can 
educate little ones uh, around what syringes look like and not to touch them. And, and so that's the safety piece for when and if they do, do see a needle. And uh, I'm going to let Interior Health uh, or Daryl. Um, we have a SHARPS task force that we have been meeting with over the past little while, and we're coming out with a community approach and all kinds of education and messaging around what to do with the needles that people are finding. So you can look forward to seeing uh, some of that come out in the next little while for sure. And I have a supplement. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say the other thing is to be, um, to be educated on uh, PPE or personal protective equipment. So know that if you do see um, syringes or use syringes, to use tongs, gloves, and have a disposal. And you can get those uh, sharps disposal containers and just use tongs to put them in. Um, the other thing, if, if there's a need where there's a number of them, you can also call the fire department. He's going to love me. Um, and they've agreed to come and um, pick them up. Yeah, and I think we've tried all those options. Uh, I can be corrected on that, but uh, sometimes it's not very practical because they won't come. And uh, some people are a little bit squeamish for picking things up, a little bit worried about it. But I have a supplementary question. What do you think about having a, a supervised injection site where everything's centralized here? They d I understand the crime rate and uh, drug addiction problems in Portugal have really gone down with that, what, what about that in Penticton? I love that question. Thank you so much for asking it. I think one, if we could look at those, again, as um, uh, Ted alluded to, people that uh, are entrenched in addictions or suffer from addictions are often trauma-based. And, um, and I think if we could resolve, if we could have a safe injection site, overdose prevention site, uh, we could eliminate some of the crime that people do to get their drugs. Um, we could eliminate the used syringes around the community because they would be disposed of where they used. So that's one of the things that we can all do as responsible citizens is support overdose prevention sites, over, uh, support safe injection sites. Thank you. Uh, we're going to save lives, and we're going to stop our sons and daughters from selling themselves, from doing crime. We're going to save a lot of hours in the ER. We're going to save hours on our police force. And uh, so please support treatment centers, overdose prevention sites, and safe injection sites, et cetera. So thank you very much. Sir, yeah. are you, do you have anything further on that as well? You mean I didn't no. say it all? No, there you go. <laughs> no, we'll go on to the next question. There you go. Okay, um, on our note of our sons and daughters, um, I'm a parent of two teenagers in our school district. Um, we have been um, working with the school district. We're a part of the partners in education. Um, we went to our partners in, during the last strategic plan, and we told them that we needed more support around mental health or brain health issues in our system. Um, my question to you is really about prevention. Um, we, parents, we need a pa uh, prevention and partnership. Parents need guidance and children need awareness and support. Um, with social media crime, um, uttering threats on social media, they don't even know that that's, that's uttering threats. Bullying. Is it possible for your department, like many other districts in, the, in, our, in BC, supply our children and parents a police liaison to strategically target preventing our youth from becoming the bad guys in 10 years' time? Yes, and that's one of our priorities moving forward. So with our, our community support and enforcement team and our mental health liaison officer, that is something that he will be engaged in. All of our schools do have a, an officer assigned to them, and now that we're coming to our full staffing levels, they will have the time to start building those relationships with the staff of the school and with the, hopefully with the individual students. That said, one of our priorities as we look at resourcing is to develop a youth liaison officer. So not really a school liaison officer. That would be difficult to do with the detachment, the regional detachment at the size that it is. But having a, a youth engagement officer that is focused on at-risk youth and at building those partnerships. 
Okay, thank you. Wendy, also, um, I also wanted to uh, talk about your website. Um, there's been a lot of um, phone calls with respect to um, con artists exploiting money from seniors and students. And I d have been looking on your website and there doesn't really seem to be a place to have real-time crime happening that would maybe prevent some of those people that are vulnerable to being taken by those crimes. We are going to be working on our website, our local um, South Okanagan, Penticton South Okanagan Smilkmeen Detachment website. That said, there are other um, ways to do that, and Fraud Busters is the most important one to, to report anything like that. That's a national program that, that tracks all of that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, and if Wendy? I can, just, I saw, I saw Wendy and then Mayor Bauer, I think your hand was up around the school resource officer of that, that issue, so. Um, just to talk uh, on your question about support in the schools, Pathways does provide a youth outreach worker in all of the middle schools. Yeah, we're aware of that, yeah. Okay, so. I think having a police presence and educating our children about what is against the law and just having a little bit more of a place for them to go and for parents to go and just ask advice without taking up police time is basically what I'm, uh, we're looking for. Um, we just sometimes just need some advice. Great. Okay. Mayor Bauer, you have the mic. Yeah, so in regards to education and schools about uh, expanded day program, for instance, is a good opportunity. Some areas, the RCMP does provide it in grade eight and nine. Uh, normally it's grade five, I believe, when they start out with. Uh, um, and other organizations you might want to talk to, um, I know in uh, the um, school district 53, we, we use uh, Mothers Against Drunk Driving for presentations. We use ICBC Road Sense for presentations. Yeah, we're, we're aware of that also, but to really show our children what addiction does and really to show them what homeless is, is something that they do not know. And the last, uh, the last <laughs> piece of information you just missed, uh, we also use the um, clients who are in the uh, drug rehabilitation center to come to the high school mm -hmm. and, and uh, explain about their own experiences. And I can tell you this really hits home. Wendy, Thank did you. you have some comments as well? Or no? Oh, sir. I just have one more. Um, Pathways has been working really closely with Queens Park School, and mm -hmm. we've developed a presentation to uh, present Elementary. to the students mm -hmm. um, in regards to homelessness and addiction and uh, empathy. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to be unrolling that shortly. Yeah, um, an example is um, children um, are being exposed to a lot of drugs that, are, that look like candy and they have nicknames. So things that are in real time that are happening, I, I do understand that those things are, are very beneficial. But to have a police liaison come in and tell our kids in real time what is actually going on is something that um, us parents need. And also, we need to know. We need to know that drugs are looking like candy. We didn't need to know what vaping is. We want to know why our kids are self-harming themselves. We want to know why our kids are taking their own lives. And we just need some help. And we want the police to be a partner in our education well, hopefully, and hopefully our community. There's a bit, hopefully there's a bit of a positive comment coming back here and maybe right after we, we want to get to a couple other questions maybe you could follow up some questions after we end up stepping down from the from the uh, the, the tabletop here. yeah okay I don't want to take too much time but just one other uh, piece of information you can organize an education and substance abuse committee we have that in the Lois and Milk Camine RCMP sits at the table community paramedics, um, addiction counselor, and they work with the school on regularly going to various different grades to uh, educate uh, students on, the, on these issues where you were uh, alluding to. Okay, that's one other um, um, kind of uh, solution you can be part of. I just, I just wanted to quickly speak to, rather than any specific service or any specific uh, model or approach. Uh, I think some really good news is coming to Penticton in, in, uh, in, the, in having a, a one-stop shop for, for, for youth in the, in the new foundry uh, that's going to be coming in the late fall. And uh, the lead organization is One Sky, but it is multiple organizations that are, are coming together. Uh, and it's kind of a hub-and-spoke model. So 
there'll be a bit of a hub. The center of the, 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 the youth center will be a hub, but then uh, it, we're gonna be connecting very well with, with many of the sectors of our, our community, and, and more specifically, the schools. And so we're looking at upstream work, earlier intervention, and I, I, I would see that uh, policing has a role to play within that model. And, and so uh, I, I think there, it's really good news for, for Penticton. This is uh, a model that's being rolled out across the province. And uh, where it's been uh, rolled out thus far, it's, it's really uh, made a significant difference. So. Thanks for the summary, Kevin. Sir, and I, I, I thank you very much for your patience. So if you can jump to your question in 30 seconds and let us know who in the panel you want to answer it, that would be absolutely wonderful. Certainly. My name is John Archer, and I uh, own uh, multiple properties here in Penticton and in Oliver. And being an investor in real estate, I watch the neighborhoods where I've invested in real estate. And one thing that draws, uh, that I have a question about is I've seen the deterioration in perimeter streets in, in various homes and in rental accommodations. And it's a slippery slope, I feel, from, for these properties to go from previously reasonably inhabitable properties to becoming uninhabitable. And it's a very, like I said, a slippery slope. Is that as a result, do you feel, as a, uh, of lack of bylaw enforcement? Or are there no bylaws in place to enforce the maintenance and the quality of these properties? Because it's, it's, it's very distressing to see, not in the immediate areas where I am, but in the community at large. Do you think, perhaps the mayor could answer this, should there be more bylaw enforcement? And maybe the police officer, because we've seen 377 Winnipeg Street. Thank you. Thank you for your question, sir. So that, that, that particular um, house is a, a good example of where we all work together. So it's not just about the bylaws, it's also about landlord tenancy, it's also the Landlord Tenancy Act and the responsibility of different landlords in that regard. So we do have bylaws, um, I'll speak to Penticton for instance, um, the good neighbor bylaw and the nuisance bylaw that if police or fire or bylaws are um, responding multiple times that then we can take enforcement action against that landlord because it is their responsibility to maintain their homes under the Landlord Tenancy Act in a reasonable and livable condition. And those are things that we would be partnering with bylaws and with the various inspectors to ensure that that's, that's being done correctly. And again, you're talking about multiple communities, so every community is going to have different bylaws. Um, and certainly areas that are governed under provincial um, law, such as um, the regional district, might have different bylaws again. So this comes right back to that broken windows theory. There's a number of houses that we've worked in partnership with bylaws, with fires, or with um, Penticton Fire Department, and with different agencies where we have been very successful either in changing the direction of the, the people so that they are complying with the the bylaws and with the what we would expect as a reasonable um, accommodation. And then there's been examples where those bylaws have been used effectively to make the landlord comply if they're not going to do that voluntarily. So we, we do have that in, in place in several of our communities. And from a policing perspective, again, we have to be very mindful of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. If somebody is a tenant, in a, a house, there is no oblig or there is no ability for the police to go into that house with a warrant or without a warrant. So it wouldn't matter if you're living in a two million dollar home up on the bench, or if you're living in a rundown house on a, a side street. The people that have legal occupancy of that house are protected by the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, and so they should be. That the police can't make any um, arbitrary approach into that house. So we have to do that in partnership. And the first person that we would start with is the landlord and the tenant to make sure that they're living up to their obligations. Thank you. Ma'am, thanks for your patience. No question problem. in 30 seconds. Um, yeah, I got two quick questions. One you can ask is, your first one to start with. Yes, How's that? that okay. Yes, it's okay. okay. One is um, we're having problems with uh, people dumping stuff in our, our back lean. Like we live in an apartment. We're the only apartment on the block. And we've asked people not to. We've on the RCMP and nothing seems to be getting done about it. And we just moved two um, sofas just the other day because we've had people doing their stuff on, our, on the couches and tagging the couches. And we've asked the neighbor if we can put up the stuff in their back lane so that the, the 
garbage would be taken away, but we've also had to take the stuff to the dump ourselves, and nothing seems to be getting done about it. Well, and, and again, that's so important that the community is calling us. So illegal dumping is a bylaw in Penticton, or it's a, it can even go to littering, for that matter, on provincial, under provincial acts. We can't uh, affect that if we don't know where it is okay. or when it's happening. So there are a number of approaches that we can take. First of all, I, I look at just recently in the paper, the city of Penticton just did their large item pickup. So. I don't understand why people who are getting a free pickup from the city of Penticton would dump a couch in someone's back alley. So that speaks to the responsibility of all of us as members of this community to take care of our community. And in terms of the policing response to that, we, if we know that that's happening, so things like cameras, I, I know that some of the, the thrift stores in my neighborhood are installing cameras and I've committed to them and our um, CSET commander is committed to them that if you get a picture of someone offloading a couch behind the fence when your business is closed, give us that picture and we'll issue a bylaw ticket to them. And they can explain why they're paying a $90 bylaw ticket instead of a $10 dump fee, which is what they should have been doing in the first place. So those are things that we can do in partnership with those agencies. I don't know if you would have the ability to do that, but it's something that is we can put the patrols on, but. The, like I said about the speed trap, if the police car goes by and someone throws the couch out, there's not much that we can do other than try to catch that person in the act. Thank you. Did, did you have a short follow-up yes, question? Because I, I think got, what we'll got, do is yes, we'll I got one quick other question. Okay, we'll take your follow-up and then we'll take one other question. Okay. Is that, is that in, what in, in, our in our apartment, um, we've had homeless people come break in and sleep in our apartment in our laundry rooms. Now we've put we put notices up. We put cameras up and nothing seems to be done. We've even caught them in the front trying to, trying to break in and we've told them to leave. Now, besides that, I don't know what else we could do. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that's where it comes is the report. So like I said earlier, uh, any crime of violence against a person is a 911 call and any crime okay. in progress is 911. So if someone's there with a crowbar trying to break into your front door of your apartment building, don't confront them, call 911. Be a good okay. witness if you can see them. If you do have video cameras, make sure that they're working and operable. Don't um, confront them. I guarantee you that if you call 911 and say someone's breaking down my door and I fear for what's going to happen, we're coming with our lights and sirens. Yeah, it's but, in an apartment but, building. But we but have yes. to know. We, it has to come to the police, and 911 is the best way to do that. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. You've all been very patient, so we're going to have one last question. The panel's been very patient, so, sir, if you can ask a question at 30 seconds, that would be absolutely wonderful. I'd um, like to thank you for hosting this meeting, and um, I look at all the questions here and compliment you on the RCMP for hosting the meeting, but many of these questions don't seem to me to be about hardcore crime, and, and I sympathize if you're being dragged in a jillion different directions to address all the issues here. Is this really where we want the RCMP to be focusing their activities or really is there a stronger role for, like a lot of this seems to be social enforcement. Um, is, is that your raison d'etre or does the community have to look at this as a, a growing problem as I read about Vernon and Kelowna having, you know, forums that the community has called. And I'm wondering, you know, is it the RCMP we call when somebody's in my laundry room? Or is it bylaw enforcement? Because I call RCMP and, and the person's back on the street three hours later and I get that there's not much you can do about it. but does the community have to somehow decide, you know, we need to take a stronger look at this. We need a, a whole range of tools here. You're one of them and you hosted this meeting, but a lot of the questions to me don't really seem to be directed to the RCMP. Well, I, I think the answer to that, as Deb just mentioned, is CAST. That's exactly what it's about. Um, so there's these pamphlets up front on the, by the projector, so I would encourage you to, to grab one of those and we'll publish that through our media outlets as well um, in the coming days or weeks. 
Um, that's exactly what CAST is about. Over 60% of our calls for service are non-chargeable, which means it's not a traditional policing role. That doesn't mean we're not involved. It, it, we are involved in addictions. We are involved in mental health. We are involved in homelessness. And we're the one agency that are not, I shouldn't say, there's three agencies that in any big community that are working 24-7. That's the police, the fire, and the ambulance. And we have a, a obligation to ser respond to calls for service, and we will. If we're not the solution to it, if the solution isn't a criminal charge, then we need to work with our partners through CAST or other tables such as Foundry and, and that sort of um, response to ensure that we're getting the people the help that they need if it's not purely a criminal offense. But as I mentioned earlier in the forum, our priority is crimes against persons, crimes against property, and supporting all of these other agencies that we're dealing, that, that we're working in partnership with. So, and sir, the answer, sorry, to someone breaking into your laundry room, it's break and enter, and that's call 911, especially if it's in progress. Someone let into a building, that we have a different conversation then. So you currently have the floor and the mic, so I'll leave it to I you do. to wrap us up here. How is that? Okay, so? I am going to wrap up very quickly, and I, again, just as Dave mentioned, I thank all of you for your patience. I thank the panel for their patience and for their participation. Um, I, I noticed that some people left early. Um, again, that, that's fine if they have questions, and the media is here, and um, this is being live streamed as well. If they do have questions, then I would encourage them to come to me either at Coffee with a Cop or um, through one of our more formal mechanisms, even coming to one of the detachments to ensure that we answer those questions. And again, I appreciate that this was a long couple of hours, so I appreciate your time. And this is what it's all about, the community getting together to ask questions and to be engaged. And I, I certainly heard loud and clear some of the concerns through the questions, and we will move forward with that. Thank you. And again, thank you all for coming. And to close it formally, I get to push the button. There you go. The one thing you never want to see in your rearview mirror. <laughs>